Home can be a tricky idea because it's bigger than just talking about where do you live. I lived in an urban culture for about 20 years of my life in the inner city of Cincinnati. That's where I had my home. And you don't hear people often in that area ask, so where's home for you? What you hear is, where do you stay at? Asking about home is too personal. It requires too much trust for a casual conversation with people that you don't know. It's none of your business where my home is. But you can safely ask me, where do I stay? Somewhere in the mid-17th century, Jurist Edmund Koch was the one who said, home is where your heart is. This month's Soul Matters theme is belonging. And I could say home is where you feel like you belong and are welcome. But that's only a part of it, too. I have moved 16 times so far in my life. Some of you may have moved more than that. My first move was great. I had nothing at all to bring. Apparently, I had a little fuzzy hat on my head. They apparently get peeved when you try that at 50. <laughs> but each initial move, I got more stuff. First, I had a bag load, then a car load, then three trucks worth. And all that stuff fills a house, but only some of it makes it home. Home isn't about the stuff, but losing the stuff is part of what hurts so badly. When you downsize willingly or get evicted unwillingly or flee from a place in fear of your life, it's about the stuff, it's not about the stuff, it's always about the stuff. And I was thinking about my moves and about asylum this week, because this week has been Sukkot, the Jewish holiday. The only requirement on those huts are that you can see the sky. You don't build them with a solid roof, because it's designed to remind you that these weren't permanent. It's designed to keep you from getting all fancy-like. It helps people remember that when the Israelites built the huts, they were fleeing. This wasn't a happy camping trip. They were fleeing as refugees, looking for asylum in a strange place, looking for someone to say, welcome home. And for 42 years, no one did. Generations grew up in a desert. Starting to sound familiar? Sukkot reminds people that we or our people have at some point been strangers in a strange land, at times fleeing from buildings called home to places in the heart called home. We left the building to look for the place where we belonged. Now, Unitarian Universalists, we find wisdom in a lot of places. Nature, sacred texts from the world religions, video games, songs, wise words from wise people. Years ago, there was a song by some guy named Jim Croce, little, little known musician. Some of you may remember it. It was called You Don't Mess Around with Jim. Does anybody remember that one? Yeah. All right. The song, for those of you who don't remember it, was essentially about a fight that didn't go well. The chorus stuck with me. You don't tug on Superman's cape. Logical. You don't spit into the wind. Okay, really logical. You don't pull the mask off the old Lone Ranger, and you don't mess around with Jim. Sometimes wisdom isn't that profound. 
Sometimes wisdom is, don't do that. It's not smart. And sometimes we ignore wisdom because it seems too simple. We overthink the story in our head is more real than the story actually unfolding. But there's another way that we leave that path of wisdom. Our human search for truth and meaning, our responsible search for truth and meaning, can get derailed when we follow the letter of the law and allow the spirit to disappear in a puff of smoke. And this has a lot to do with the idea of home. Common sense and wisdom are cousins. They kind of look alike. But common sense often gets slaughtered in the name of saving wisdom. Over the last few years, I've heard arguments, and all of you may have heard them too, about who deserves to get to find a home in the United States. Who deserves? And I felt like saying, you know what? We stole an entire country. We stole a whole country. Who in the blazes are we to say who gets to come? Who deserves? But I've heard people say that while they were sad, sad, that families were being scared at the border. Parents should have thought of that before they came here. They should have stayed home. And that's home with a small h, home the building. They should have stayed somewhere else is the subtext. And I wanted to tell them, and sometimes I did tell them, that no one walks across a desert, not for one year or 40 years, when there's still a home for you to go to. You may have a house. You may have a small H home, the place where you stay at. But home is long gone before you ever set one foot in that desert. And for you all who are smaller people in here, for you all who are under the age of 18, right now it's scary for a lot of the kids on our borders because they're coming with their moms or their dads or their aunts or uncles or sometimes with no big people whatsoever. And we don't always do a good job of treating them right. We put them in kid jails and hold them at the border till we can figure out if we can let them in or not. And as Unitarian Universalists, that's not our idea of how this should work. So we're pretty upset about it as a group. When I first started to get involved with immigration reform, I heard this one. It was a very, very religious Christian person, and they were arguing about the line from their Bible which said, love your neighbor as yourself. And what they were arguing about was, well, exactly what do you mean by my neighbor? <laughs> Apparently, they'd never heard Mr. Rogers. <laughs> their argument was that, well, of course, everyone couldn't be their neighbor. I mean, that was a silly thing. That couldn't be what was meant, so they had to figure out who their neighbor actually was. And they're actually looking at Greek and Latin and Aramaic and tracing the idea of where the word neighbor, and I thought, I don't believe this. Someone else started to argue about the meaning of the word love, and they started to throw around some knowledge about the Greek idea of love and the divine idea of love and agape and fraternity and personal love and... It all came down to looking for a loophole so that they could keep hating all the people they hated before the start of this discussion. These are the kind of arguments that want to give people a home with a small h, a place to live, as defined by Webster's Dictionary, but not a home with a big h, not a heart home, not a place where you feel like you belong and are safe when you go there. It's the difference between welcoming someone into your church, your town, your country, or welcoming it, them into their new home. 
One's a hut, one's a big house. Judaism gets around this idea in a really novel way. It comes right out and tells you not to be an idiot while practicing your religion, and I mean that literally. <laughs> During the entire week of Sukkot, Jews are supposed to actually live in the Sukkah. And they define that. By live, it means you have to sleep there if only for a nap, eat there at least once a day, picnic there if only for a piece of bread, and study holy writing there. They don't leave it to chance. <laughs> this is what we meant when we said live. Stop arguing. You have to furnish it. That means you have to bring out a table, a chair, a rug, some candles. So where are the loopholes? There aren't any. The instructions are flat. The letter of the law says to sleep there. Now, the spirit of the law tells people, we're doing this because we want to remember that we were community. We were safe and sheltered <coughs> during the trip to the promised land. So if you ask, well, okay, so good, supposed to be sleeping out there. What if I'm sick? Go inside, the rabbis say. We're commemorating being kept comfortable. You'll be comfortable inside. Well, what if I get cold? What if there are mosquitoes? What if it smells funny? Go inside? Were you not listening a minute ago? Next year, build somewhere less stinky. <laughs> Bring bug spray. But what if it rains? Oh, gas. If your house was leaking, you wouldn't lay there and get drenched. We're commemorating being comforted. The plagues are in a few months. Torment yourself then. <laughs> Don't sleep in an icy rain. Don't picnic in a hailstorm. Do not hurt yourself in order to celebrate a holiday about being comforted. Fulfill the heart, not the letter of the law. <coughs> Break the rules to fulfill the rules. <laughs> Judaism is clear, break the rules if you need to, but do it to understand the deeper idea. And as we search for truth and meaning, the Jewish idea has a lot of value. Sometimes the rules don't work. Sometimes following the letter of the law only serves as a miscarriage of justice. Sometimes you can only do so much because all of the stuff is getting in the way. One of the toughest things I've been asked about over the last year is about breaking the law. How do you know when it's morally right? I reminded the person asking that the Holocaust was legal, that the people who fed and hid Anne Frank in the attic were criminals. Right now, children in cages at the border, that's legal. We're fighting it, but it's still legal. Georgia slave masters and overseers, they were legal too. Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth were criminals. Being a UU means you don't get handed some holy book and told, here it is. You don't get handed a neat set of interpretations and told, there you go. All the truth you can handle right there. We don't even get handed directions to a library. We are the people of burning questions, and we have to figure this out for ourselves. We have the wonderful and terrible job of finding wisdom and figuring out what rules we will follow, follow in order to live an ethically and morally sound life. That's on each of us. Once you figure out what you believe is ethical and moral, you write your own internal rules for what you're supposed to do. When the rules and the laws of our world promote the spread of evil, 
When rules and laws help to unmake justice, to destroy divine order, to unmake all of our planet, and to turn the arc of the universe toward oppression, then it is your calling to heal the world, to heal the home of the world, to bend the arc to justice, to renounce evil under its guise of order, to build that capital H heart home for your neighbors and yourself. Sometimes laws and rules are shelters. But when they don't protect and comfort and build walls of safety, but instead trap and frighten, it's time to tear them down and build again. Search responsibly for truth and meaning. Determine the rules that you will live by ethically. When rules and laws created by humans violate the very things they claim to uphold, refuse to be bound. When the hail starts falling, take your picnic inside. But invite your neighbors to go with you if you can. Do the best you can, though you can't do it all. When the spirit and the letter conflict, let the spirit say do and be guarded and guided by all that you hold dear, by all that you know in your heart and soul to be moral and good. Make the world a better place. Welcome each other home. Blessed be.